If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You have been partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. You have been raised up together with Christ and made to sit together in the heavenly places. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world. Jesus said to believers, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And I open this sermon with a series of verses to say that Christians are different and special. They're not like everybody else anymore. They're not living like them, and they're not under the, the judgment of God anymore. Instead, they have been set apart by God for God. And Peter has told the suffering saints in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, that they are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and God's own very special people. Therefore, they are the most blessed people on the earth. They're the elite, if you will, because God has chosen to have intimate communion and fellowship with them. He has chosen to make himself known to them by indwelling them. So they may live in this world, but they're not like it anymore. Peter says, now they are sojourners and pilgrims, which means they're like a people from a, a far country, living in a foreign land, but it's not really their home anymore. Well, from verse 13 of chapter 2 to verse 6 of chapter 3, Peter deals with the topic of submission. Because he doesn't want the saints to think that because they're, they're in the world and out of the world, that they can somehow live however they want. He doesn't want them uh, to, to think that they don't have a responsibility to be submissive while they're here in this world. So he tells them in chapter 2, verses 13 to 17, submit to the governing authorities. And then in verses 18 to 21, they need to submit to those who are their masters or employers, or those who are over them at their jobs. And then in chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, wives need to submit to their own husbands. So yes, Christians are God's special people. But that does not exempt them from, from submitting to those whom God has placed over them in this life. Right? And, and Peter has just said uh, in chapter 2, verse 12, that they are to have honorable conduct among the Gentiles. And one of the ways that they do that is by submitting to the governing authorities. What I'd like to do today is consider that, verses 13 to 17, which deals with, with submitting to governing authorities using a two-point outline. Honorable conduct submits to authority, and honorable conduct silences ignorance. Submits to authority, silences ignorance. Let's look at submits to authority in verses 13 and 14. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. All right? Peter starts with the word therefore. Therefore, meaning because you are sojourners and pilgrims. Because you are that, you have to have honorable conduct among the Gentiles. And honorable conduct is that you submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. And submit means to willfully come under. To willfully come under another's authority. It means to submit to, to one's control. It means to obey. And the truth is, we're to submit to those who are over us in every category of life. Every sphere the Lord has put us in, we have submission to deal with. First and foremost, we're to submit to God. And we're to submit to Him in everything, to every word and every ordinance of God. James said in chapter 4, verse 7, submit yourselves to God. Right? Ephesians 4, 24, 5.24 says that the church, us, believers, we submit to Christ. Hebrews 12.9 says we're to be in subjection to the Father of spirits. Right? So we're to submit to God in everything. Also, wives are told in Ephesians 5.21, submit to their husbands. Children are told in Ephesians 6.1, submit to their parents. 
even as Jesus did to Mary and Joseph while he was growing up. After staying back after their feast in Jerusalem, we read in Luke 5.21 that, uh, that he went down with them, Mary and Joseph, and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. Subject to them. Servants ought to be submissive to their masters, employees to their employers, which we'll look at in my next sermon. Christians ought to be submissive to the elders of the church. Hebrews 13, 7, 17 says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive. For they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. And as we see today, we're to submit to the local, state, and federal authorities. Now it is true as Christians uh, that we're not of this world uh, and our ultimate citizenship is not here, it's in heaven. But while we're here, the Lord calls us to submit to those who have authority in it. Right? We have to obey the laws and statutes of our land. Paul told Titus in chapter 3, he said, listen, tell the saints to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey and be ready for every good work. Submit. Romans 13, 1-7, we just read it. Paul gives the most extensive writing on submitting to the governing authorities in the New Testament. And in verse 1 he says, Let every soul, that's all of us, be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Now the truth is, submission is extremely unnatural for us. Very unnatural for us. Uh, it goes against our, our sin-stained grain. It just does. We don't want people telling us what to do. We don't like authority over us. Like, who does? We don't like it. When Gloria, our daughter, Glo, was five years old, I was talking with her, and I said, you know, Glo, I said, I think you may be our only kid. In fact, she is. And I said to her, at the age of five, I said, you know, you may have to take care of Mommy and I when we get old. And she's thinking about it. The little wheels are spinning, and she's thinking some more, and she says to me, all right, I'll take care of you, but one thing. I'll be the boss. <laughs> to which I said, you could be the boss. But you see the heart. I don't want to submit to you once I get out of this place. All right? Uh, so we want to be in control. We want to be in control of our lives. We want to be the captain of our own ship. And this was the reason our first parents fell in the garden. And thus we fell in them. Right? They didn't want to submit to the will and to the word of God. And the consequences for refusing to submit to authorities range from things like death, to prison, uh, to wrecking relationships, to a life full of conflict and hardships, and so on. So, so we're not naturally good with submission, but it's mandated in the Christian life. And, and the Lord Jesus himself lived a life of total submission. He submitted himself, first and foremost, always to do the will of God. Right? When he was confronted with, with, with having to drink the cup of God's wrath to atone for our sins, while sweating as it were great drops of blood, what did he pray? He said, Father, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. But not my will. I submit to your will. Your will be done. And he submitted himself to the law of God. And he submitted himself to the laws of Rome. And he submitted himself to the Jewish laws. So much so, we read in Matthew 17, 27, that he actually paid the temple tax, which he didn't have to do because he was above the temple. The temple was a picture of him, right? Not only for himself, but also for Peter as well. And by the way, he lived under a, an unjust and unrighteous rule all of his life. Yet he never attacked the government. He never spoke ill of its rulers. He never demonstrated or held a demonstration against them. He didn't start a Jewish Live Matters movement. Right? or rally to defund the Roman soldiers. Right? He never promoted a, a political candidate. He never said, let's go storm Rome and take over it. He didn't do those things. He didn't campaign against slavery. He didn't campaign against the abuse of women or poverty or racism. He never lodged a complaint of the multitude of abuses and sins committed against him during his trials, all rigged. Right? All he ever spoke about was the kingdom of God. And he called sinners to repentance and to follow him. He simply entrusted himself to his father who judges righteously. So he never got involved in any social issues or activism, which sadly, so many in the church today do. And it's not the gospel. I'm not saying we shouldn't right wrongs if we can, but it's not the gospel. Our mission is the gospel. 
He was never a threat to the Roman government, although that would be what they accused him of and would crucify him for. So he submitted himself to every ordinance of man. And since we're united to Christ uh, and, and where to live as he lived, we too must submit to every ordinance of man. And the word ordinance in the Greek means to create or creation. And it is almost always, not always, almost always used for God creating. But here it is used of the laws and ordinance that men create. And the reason we're to obey the laws men create is because God has sovereignly placed them in the positions they're in. Again, Romans 13.1 says that God has set up all authorities in government. And then in verse 2 he says, if you oppose or resist these authorities, you actually are opposing and resisting the ordinance of God. So since God has created all things and he has placed individuals in authority, therefore the laws they create ought to be obeyed as if God created them. Now you may be saying, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are we to obey the law if the law is wicked and sinful? Are we to follow the law if the law tells us to sin or keeps us from what God commands us to do or goes against Christian conscience? The answer to that is no, we're not. We're not. If any law mandates us to have abortions, kill the elderly, doesn't allow us to read our Bibles, we're not allowed to share the gospel, well, we shouldn't obey that. We should not obey that, right? When Pharaoh told the Hebrew midwives you had to kill all the baby boys as they're born, they didn't do it. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were told they needed to worship the king's idol or they would be thrown into the fiery furnace, they wouldn't do it. When the early Christians were told they Needed to, they needed to worship Caesar as Lord, or God, if you will, uh, and then offer up incense to him, they wouldn't do it. So if the government tells us to do anything that is sinful or goes against conscience, we can't do it. In Acts 5, the Jewish leaders, they arrest the apostles for preaching in Jesus' name, and they say, you're not allowed to preach in his name anymore. You're not allowed to, to use that name anymore. Well, the apostles said in verse 29 of Acts 5, we ought to obey God rather than men. Now, outside of the authorities asking us to sin or violate conscience, we're to obey their every ordinance. But you may object, object and say, well, but what if, if the ruler is wicked? What if he or she is a tyrant? Are we still to submit to them? Yes. Yes. The Bible says submit to the governing authorities, and that means every kind of governing authority, whether a democratic republic or a dictatorship, or a monarchy, or a socialistic government, or any other kind of government that I don't even know about, we're to submit. Right? We're to submit to all leaders, whether they're good, they're bad, or they're ugly. We're to submit. And you know, when Peter and Paul wrote about submitting to the governing authorities, the king, or the supreme authority, was Nero, the emperor of Rome. And Nero was a vile and wicked and twisted man. Murdered countless people, brutally persecuted Christians. Burned down half of Rome so he could, he could build it up again. And, and secular history tells us he had Paul beheaded and he had Peter crucified upside down. And yet both of them tell the saints to obey him. Why? Because government is God's idea. It's how he keeps people from anarchy. Government is God's idea and how he keeps people from anarchy. Right? Like in the days, in the days of the kings, before the kings, in, in the days of Judges, we read in Judges 21, 25, in those days there was no king in Israel. Here it is. Here's anarchy. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. No law. No justice. Right? Everybody just do what they want to do. That's called anarchy. And, 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 and so then, a, a bad government is better than no government at all. That's what, what, what Peter is telling us. A bad government is better than no government at all. Because even a bad government, to some degree, restricts evil. Right? To some degree, restricts evil. And, and to some degree, protects its people. One commentator said, as long as original sin remains inherent in human nature, Caesar will always have plenty to do. So we might not like certain leaders, but we need to submit to them. 
right? You may not like the new administration, but you must submit to them. Because to resist them is to resist the command of God. That's what it is. And I know social media and so many Christians don't like this and don't like that, and I get it. I get it. But you know what? This is elevated to a high level. This is the will of God. So to submit to every ordinance of man means we submit to the police. Right? We submit to the police. If they, if they tell you to do something or not do something, then do it or don't do it. Don't argue with them. Don't fight with them. Don't curse them out. Do what they tell you. When Paul was arrested and thrown in prison for preaching the gospel on multiple occasions, he didn't fight the authorities. He didn't go kicking and screaming. He didn't stiffen his body to make it hard for them to pick him up and drag him off. Right? He didn't do that. He didn't curse him out. He didn't post pictures of, 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 the, of Roman brutality of an old Jewish man on Facebook and Instagram. I didn't do that. He willingly allowed himself to be taken and whipped and chained. He willingly did it. And then, like in the Philippian prison with Silas in Acts 16, we see he's praying and singing hymns to God, praising God, suffering for the gospel's sake. So then, obey the police. Obey the laws of the road. Don't speed. Use your blinkers. Get your car inspected. Don't park in front of fire hydrants. Obey the tax codes and laws by paying your taxes. When the Jewish leaders asked if Jesus, Jesus, should we pay taxes to Caesar? It was a trick question, of course, because if he says yes, then he's going to have everybody's going to be annoyed with him because they hated Rome and they were heavily taxed. And in fact, it was almost uh, uh, the, 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 whoever was taxing was skimming. And if he says no, well, then they go to the Roman authorities. Oh, he doesn't want to pay taxes. All right? And should we do that? And he says in Matthew 22, 21, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. But then he is the clincher, and to God, the things that are God's. So pay your taxes. Pay your taxes. All right? and, and Paul says the same things in, in Romans chapter 13, verse 7. He says, render to all they do, taxes to whom taxes are due, custom to whom customs are due. And the reason he gives in verse 4 is because government protects the people and provides services for them. So we submit to all the governing authorities from the president to the local council person because Peter says they are sent by God. They are sent by God. And Romans 13.4 says they are God's servants for good. So then every person in authority, good, bad, or otherwise, has been divinely placed there by God for a season. God put Pharaoh in the position of being the supreme ruler of Egypt, and we know from Romans 9.17 that, that he says why. He says that I may show my power in you, Pharaoh, that my name may be declared great in all the earth. God put that man there so that he could basically take him down and be glorified for it. At the end of the day, God always does what he does for his own glory. Amen? Amen? God put Pontius Pilate in the position as governor. And remember what he says to Jesus, you're not answering me? I'm asking questions, you're not answering me? I could put you to death right now. I have the authority to do that. I have the power to do that. And so what does Jesus say to him? He said, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given from above. God gave it to you. God gave it to you. And sometimes God puts wicked rulers in leadership as a judgment against the people. A quote that's been kind of popular now, but I've known it for a while. Uh, it's a Calvin quote, John Calvin, and he said this, when God is going to judge a people, he gives them wicked rulers. Because that's what the people want. Right? The people want sin. That's what, can you not see we're there? People want sin. They want iniquity. They, they hate righteousness. So he gives them leaders that will allow them to go deeper and deeper into that. And what he's doing is Romans 1, he's giving them over to what they want, which puts them deeper and deeper into, into sin. In Daniel chapter 4, verse 17, King Nebuchadnezzar said that though the Most High rules, uh, that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and he gives it to whom, whomever he will and sets over it the lowest of men. He chooses who the rulers are. God puts them over us. And, and it's not a mistake that they're in the position that they're in. People may have voted them in 
or maybe not voted them in, but they got in anyway, but it's always God's will that they win or that they're appointed. And it's always for his purposes. Proverbs 21.1, which we read, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Boom, he's got him, right? President Biden is in the Lord's hand. He turns it wherever he wishes. It's like rivers of water. He does what he wants for good or for evil. He turns it the way he wants it to go. Well, Peter said, submit to every ordinance of man and every means what? It means every. Every means every. The ones you like and the ones you don't like. Right? And, and then he gives us the motive for the submission. And here it is. Here's why you do it. For the Lord's sake. For the Lord's sake. You do it for the Lord's sake. You see how he ratchets it up to the Lord right there? Because it goes against our grain. Well, I don't like that guy. I don't like that lady. I don't like this regime or whatever it is. You do it for the Lord's sake. You do it for the Lord's sake. And, and so we're, we're to submit to the governing authorities because it pleases God, because, because that's what God wants us to do. You see, we're, we're submitting, we're to submit to the governing authorities as if we're submitting to the Lord himself. So, so he's the reason we submit to those over us. When we are surrendered to God, we surrender to those he has placed over us because he has placed them over us. Because we love him and trust him and we know an all-wise, all-sovereign God always does what's best and always does what's right. And he's always working his will and doing that. So for his sake, his sake, we submit to those over us. Now some of you might be sitting there saying, oh, I'm uncomfortable with this. I get it. Maybe you were four years ago. Maybe you are today. It doesn't make a difference how uncomfortable you feel. It's for the Lord's sake. Right? Uh, and, and so we're to submit to those over us. And we should submit gladly, gladly, even as our Lord Jesus submitted himself gladly to the incarnation, leaving heaven, becoming a man, and going all the way to the cross. He submitted to all of that. Well, for the Lord's sake implies that our obedience serves the Lord's purposes. If we're doing it for his sake, he has a reason for it, right? For his purposes. Right? He's He's fulfilling his will in history by raising up and taking down leaders and nations and our submission to them is part of that. So then we can't, we can't be, be, be angry and complaining. Instead, we should be able to look a politician or a police officer or some government official in the eye and say, I submit to you and I honor you not for your sake, but I do it for the Lord's sake. I do it for the Lord's sake. I honor you because God rules over me and he has sovereignly raised you up for a, a limited time and given you authority over me. And woe to the Christian, here's in our context, who says, or who have said, this president is my president. Right? Some have said, well, Trump's not my president. Well, guess what? He was. Now I'm reading some saying, you know, that, that Biden's not my president. Guess what? He is. You know what? He is. And, and you've got to honor him. You have to honor him. You don't got to like his policies, but you've got to honor him because God rose, raised him up. God put him there, right? Remember back in the year 2000 when the, when, when, when the election was like, like basically came down to a couple of hundred, what do they call them, chads or shards down in Florida, or, you know, whether they were punctured or not? And I mean, I mean, it was like three weeks and they're counting them over again and whether it was going to be Bush or whether it was going to be... Um, Gore, thank you. All right? And, and then we were all like, like well, who's going to be the president? And it came down to a couple of hundred votes in southern Florida where people couldn't, they didn't press it in all the way. They did press it all the way. Listen, that was all the Lord's will. All right? The Lord's will was to give us Bush by a couple of hundred, vo a couple of hundred charts or whatever they're called. All right? It's his, his will. All right? So we can look at them and say, I honor you for the Lord's sake. Uh, and the reason I can do what goes against the grain uh, for so many is because now Ephesians 5.18 says that I can be filled with the Spirit and controlled by the Spirit. So I can look past everything else going on on the horizon and I can look upward. Well, verse 14, Peter gives us the purpose for government. And that is for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. So government should be punishing evildoers. That's what it should be doing. It should be punishing evildoers evildoers. And, 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 and punish means to exact vengeance. This is the job of the police, right? And this is the job of the judicial system. This is what they're supposed to do. And sadly, we live in a day when people want to 
Get rid of the police. Defund the police. Dismantle them. The very ones whose job it is to, to catch the evildoers and, and, and exact justice. We ought to be thankful for those guys. I know they're not all good apples, but a lot of them are, and that's what God put them there. All right, so be thankful for the people who work in that, in that field and judges and lawyers and all that other kind of stuff. God has put them there. Right? Evildoers are those who hurt people and murder people and rob and cheat others. And God set up the principle, a life for a life, all the way back in Genesis 9, 6. So if you willfully take a life, guess what? Scripture says you forfeit your own. Because life is precious and it's a precious gift from God. And no individual has the right to take it. No individual does. But God gives the government the right to do and extract judgment because of, of them taking a life. Paul said in Romans 13, 4, he said, he, that's the law, is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. So government is God's tool to protect people by weeding out those who carry out evil. The second part of government, or their purpose, is to, to praise those who do good. And to do good in this context means those who are law-abiding, those who submit to the governing authorities, those who live as good citizens. Uh, and the praise they receive, if you will, is that they're able to live a peaceable life uh, and, and one without fear. Uh, and they're left alone to work and to worship as they desire. Now, when government does not punish evil and does not reward good, they are not functioning as God has intended. And sadly, and I say this sadly, I, I think more and more this is the land we live in, uh, where, where evildoers are rewarded and, and those who do good are punished. And, and may God be pleased to reverse this. And if we need to repent as a nation, which we do, and then may God be pleased to do that, but certainly as the church, we need to not, not, not focus on the world, but focus on the kingdom that we're in and, 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 and the home that we're going to and that we've inherited. Amen? So honorable conduct submits to authority. Secondly, honorable conduct silences ignorance. Verses 15 to 17. But this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Well, Peter says we should submit to the governing authorities, and now in verses 15 to 16, he, he says why? Because it is the will of God that by doing good, we should silence the ignorance of foolish men. So God desires that our good behavior would silence the mouth of those who speak evil against us. And again, doing good in this context is being a good citizen. It's submitting to the local authorities and all governing authorities. It's leading a life that is blameless, one that has honorable conduct among unbelievers. All right, so then we're not rioting. We're not, we're not breaking store windows or looting or burning down businesses or throwing uh, Molotov cocktails in police cars. We're not doing that kind of stuff. We're not hurting people because we're not angry at society. We're not disrespecting police officers when they pull us over. We're not cheating the government or speaking ill of our leaders. We're submitting to them, and we're doing so for the Lord's sake. And when we do, Peter says, it will at times silence the ignorance of foolish men. And the word silence means to muzzle, to stop the mouth, to make speechless. Right? When Jesus told the Sadducees who said there was no resurrection, right, and he, he showed them that certainly there is a resurrection, but the, the Bible says he silenced them. Like he put a muzzle on. Look at they say. There was like no answer. He, he just totally, he totally showed them scripturally where they were absolutely wrong. He did in, he did in two minutes what the, what, the, what the scribes and the Pharisees couldn't do in 50 years because he used the scriptures. Paul uses the word, the same word, silenced, in 1 Timothy 5.18 when he says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. And what he's saying is you need to support those who preach the gospel to you. Don't, don't make them starve and like, you know, not, not be able to put clothes on their back when they're being preaching the gospel. You gotta, you know, don't muzzle them, feed them, clothe them, support them, right? So this silencing is, 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 is like taking every accusation out of the mouth of those who accuse you. 
It's when the folly of the accuser is exposed and they realize that they should not talk badly about you anymore. Oh my, I made a mistake. This person's like, not like that at all. Because they see your life and your good behavior, right? As they watch you. And remember we said in verses 11 and 12, they're watching. Now the word ignorance, it's the opposite of knowledge. Uh, and it's willful. They choose to be ignorant. Right? These are people that are willfully, willfully, willfully ignorant of the truth of God. Uh, and and, and they're ignorant that you're a new creation in Christ and you're now living for him and that you're committed to him and you're committed to doing righteousness and they're ignorant of your high calling by which you have been called. So truth is foreign to them. In fact, Romans 1.21 says they suppress the truth, push it down in unrighteousness. I don't want to hear it. God said of Israel in Jeremiah 4.22, for my people are foolish. They have not known me they are silly children and they have no understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good, they have no knowledge. So then they're ignorant of Christ and they're ignorant of their great need for Christ. Now the word foolish means without reason, without reflection, and has no intelligence. We read of the farmer in, in the parable in Luke 12:20, uh, who has a bumper crop and he decides he's going to hoard all of this stuff that he has gotten, now, all of these riches, and he's going he's to take rest for the rest of his life. He's just going to live off all this stuff he got. And then God says to him, fool, there's the word, fool. This night your soul is required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? It's a rhetorical question. It's not yours anymore. So by your submission and obedience and doing good to those who accuse you and speak evil of you, they will be quieted. Not all the time, but on, on, on the average. Right? They'll have nothing to say. What can they say? How can they accuse you? Now, we don't silence these ignorant fools by arguing with them. We don't silence them by having these heated debates with them. But by rather living a blameless life. Living a blameless life. One man said this. He said, holy living is the best reply to infidel speaking. Holy living is the best reply to infidel speaking. And those who speak evil against Christianity, they may have high IQs, may have PhDs, but here's the thing, they are ignorant and they are foolish. Why? Because they criticize Christ's likeness. And amazingly, they think Christians are the ignorant and the foolish ones. Right? They think Christians are the cause for, for many, if not all, of the ills of society. But our good is often what silences them. Well, Peter continues and says, as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice. And free does not mean free from following the laws of men. Free does not mean uh, that, that we can just do what we want. Uh, it does not mean that we are not required to do good while we're here. But as free, what it does mean is that we are free before God uh, and that we are free in a spiritual sense. We're, we're free from the wages of sin. We're free from the, from the law of sin and death. We're free from the curse of the law, which is eternal damnation for our sins against God. We're, we're free from the power and enslavement of sin. Romans 6.18 and then 22 says we're, we're, we were slaves of sin, but we've been set free from sin and have become slaves of righteousness. Verse 22, he says, now having been set free from sin, we've become slaves. Slaves of God. See, everybody's a slave. Either of unrighteousness or of righteousness. Either of Satan or of Christ. Everybody's a slave. Paul says in Galatians 5, 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So we're free from the debt that we owe God because Christ has paid it for us. We're going to take the Lord's table today. We're going to celebrate it. That's exactly what it is. All right, Jesus said in John 8, 33, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So now we're free to come to God anytime, and we're free to have intimate fellowship with Him. But we're not free to sin. Right? We're not free to disobey the authorities over us. Right? We're not free to violate the law. So we can't use our freedom in Christ as an excuse to rebel against those over us. Or, or as a way to keep us from obeying the laws that are over us. So Peter says, you're free, but don't use your liberty as a cloak or a covering or a mask for vice. And vice means ill will. It means, it means wickedness. 
So then, don't use your freedom or your liberty in Christ to camouflage sin. Paul said in Galatians 5.13, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Now, do you know and do you want to know what true liberty means? It means we can live lives uh, as we should live lives, not as we please. It means we can live for Christ and not for the flesh. You can live as God has created you to live now. You can live as a child of God. You've been free to now come under the submission of God. You're free to now be a slave of Christ. It means we can live for Christ and not for the flesh. So we don't use our position in Christ as a covering to allow us to sin. We could say, hey, I answer to a high authority. I don't have to follow the laws of men. I'm under the law of God. I'm a pilgrim and a sojourner. I don't got to worry about what's going on here. But we do. Because the one we answer to has told us to obey the laws of where we are. One commentator said, the cause of Christ is never advanced by evil masquerading in religious clothes. So don't abuse your liberty in Christ. Don't pervert a doctrine as a license to fulfill the desires of the flesh or to be lazy or not evangelize or, or, or not to do good to all. Yes, you're free in Christ, spiritually speaking, but you're under all kinds of authority in this life. We all are. So submit to every, every authority that God puts over you because Peter says at the end of verse 16, you are a bondservant of God. And a bondservant means a slave. And slaves had no rights. A slave was, was, was the property of another person. And when Christ redeemed you, he purchased you out of the slave market of sin, and he freed you, but, but you became his slave. And he's a good master. He's a wonderful master. Paul said in, in, in Acts 12, 20, 28, that he has purchased the church, and that's you, right? The church is everybody, with his blood. There's the payment right there. That's his life, right? Peter said in, in 1 Peter 1.19 that you were ransomed, bought back, right, from your enslavement to sin with the precious blood of Christ. Uh, so, so we're slaves of Christ, right? We're, we're slaves of Christ. We were once slaves of sin, but Romans 6 says we're now slaves of Christ. And every single Christian is a slave of Christ. A and the truth is you've never truly been free until you're a slave of Christ. Because now you're free to live the way God calls you to live. So you're free. But, but what you're free to do is to live as a slave of Christ. Well, Peter closes verse 17 by giving us four commands. And they are honor all people, love the brethren, fear God, honor the king. Uh, these are four realities of those who are slaves of Christ. All of us we're commanded to do this. So honor all people. And the word honor means to esteem and to value. Esteem and value. So we're to honor those who rule over us and we're to honor those who don't. Right? There's no one that we're not to honor, actually. Uh, we're, 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 we're to honor those who are weak and small in the world's eyes. We're to honor the nobodies of society, which quite, quite honestly, we, we fit that bill pretty well. We're to honor the nobodies of society. And the reason we honor all people is because all people are made in the image of God and worthy of that kind of honor. Worthy of it. Everybody has dignity in God's eyes because they all share in God's attributes to some degree. Secondly, love the brotherhood, which means love the saints. Right? We honor all men, but we must genuinely love the saints because all men will know where Jesus' disciples are by our love for one another. John 13, 35. Thirdly, fear God, he says. Fear God. And fear does not mean tremble with terror and dread, but it means to reverence here. Uh, and, and we need to fear him so our heart is set on doing his will and pleasing him. Right? We're not going to be one of doing the Lord's will if we don't have a, a great honor and, and reverence for him. The only way we can rightly worship him is if we fear him. And we can't honor all men, and we can't love the brother, and we won't honor the king if we don't first fear God. Well, Peter closes, and he says, honor the king. And here's the thing. We don't fear the king. We're talking about, in our case, the president. We don't fear the king, uh, but we don't honor him. And the king, or supreme ruler in our case, of course, is the president. And I am very saddened by how many Christians actually 
whether it had been Trump then or Biden now, they say, I hate, I hate Trump. I've heard Christians say this to me. I hate him. I hate Christians now. I, I, I hate Biden. Seriously? Is that honoring the king? You hate him? Right? You're to love all men, even your enemies. You hate him? If you say that, you need to repent. Not a, it's not a political speech. This is a, this is a kingdom speech. This is a kingdom sermon. I don't care what side of the aisle you call yourself on. All right? We're to honor the king. And that's the president now. You don't like this guy? Well, the Bible tells us pray for him. All right? Because he's in the Lord's hand. And the Lord can turn him this way, the Lord can turn him that way. You don't like the House of Representatives? Pray for him. You don't like the Senate? Pray for them. Because they're all in it. You don't like the assembly people, whoever they are? Most of us don't even know who they are, right? Pray for them. Pray for them. We don't have to agree with them, but we have to submit to them. And we have to honor them for the Lord's sake. And I pray that we would grow in this area, but all areas of submission. We need to talk like Christians, right? So if you're on Facebook, you know, condemning the administration now, stop. If you did it before, you need to repent and stop. Well, let me close by leaving you with something to stop, which is going to be this, and then two questions uh, to ask. And the thing to stop is stop bad-mouthing politicians. Stop bad-mouthing authorities. Stop making memes of them doing all kinds of crazy things. Stop. I don't even laugh at it anymore. I'm, I'm studying this and I'm realizing I'm guilty. Here it is, man. I'm, I, got, I, got, I got one going that way. I got, four, I got three coming this way. All right? I'm guilty. I've done this. And it's wrong. It's sinful. It's unhonoring to God. It's just not. We need to stop doing this. Listen, we dishonor God when we dishonor them. You're making jokes about the president or this senator or that congressperson. You're dishonoring God. Don't send me those memes anymore because I don't want to sin too. Right? We got to stop. I got to stop. You got to stop. Stop speaking ill of them and do what Paul says in 1 Timothy 2 too. Pray for them. Pray for those in authority. My first question. What do we do if we have wicked laws? What do we do if we have wicked laws? How are we to deal with the legalization of abortion? Abortion up to, up to birth. A death of a baby aborted that doesn't die, leave them on the table to die. What do we do with that? What do we do with all kinds of drugs being legal, marijuana and everything else? What do we do with no bail in New York State? That's a kind of a wicked law, right? What are we to do with those? And on and on and on, there are plenty of them. What are we to do with the one just passed or signed into law a couple of days ago? The Equality Act, where transgenders, you know, guys who think they're girls, could basically play on girls' sports teams in high school and college and be in the, be in the locker rooms and go to, men can go to women's bathrooms and Christian schools are going to have to make allowance for this. So what do we do with that? That's certainly a wicked law. What do we do with that? Should we protest? Should we burn down abortion clinics? Should we storm Albany with our demands? No. We do what Christians have been doing for 2,000 years. We preach and we pray. We preach and we pray. I'm not saying there's not a place for, for writing in and we have votes and we should use all of that stuff, but we preach and we pray. There's our, there's our strength. Right? We preach and we pray. We share the gospel at abortion clinics and on the streets to those in authority and those who one day may have authority. It's the gospel that has the power to change a person from the inside out. It's the gospel that changes how one thinks and gives them God's mind on things. And we can pray and we must pray that God would be pleased to put down wickedness and stop evil. Of course we pray that. Like in Acts 12, 5, when the saints offering up constant prayer for Peter, who's in prison by Herod. All right, so we pray, we pray, we pray. So the power of the church is not in protest, not in sit-ins, not in any other human technique, but in preaching and prayer. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Well, my second question is this. Are you giving ignorant fools a reason to speak ill of you? Are you giving ignorant fools a reason to speak ill of you? Are you not submitting to the authorities over you? Are you not honoring all men? Because if you are not, you're giving fuel to ignorant fuels as fools to speak evil of you and by extension evil of our Lord evil of the Lord 
So therefore, brothers and sisters, as free men and women in Christ, let us live in submission to all for his sake. And now a word to anyone who's not saved this day. And that is that if you're not saved, then you're not free because you are still a slave of sin. But you can be set free, and you can be set free even today from the penalty and the power of the sin that condemns you. How's that, you may ask? Well, by believing in Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins on the cross, and that, that he rose three days later, conquering, conquering sin and death for you. Therefore, turn from your sins and turn to Christ and do it today. He can set you free from a life of helplessness and fear and hopelessness. He can set you free from the curse of the law and bless you with everlasting life. Remember the promise of Jesus in John 8, and that is, if the Son makes you free and only He can do it, you will be free indeed, amen? So come to Christ today and find out what it really means to be free. Let's pray. Father, as I have struggled greatly in preparing this sermon because I know how it goes against my own natural grain, I thank you that you have shown me my sin and would shown me what, what is good and right. And I pray for myself and my brothers and sisters that we would do what is good and right, and that we would honor you and exalt you and give praise to you by submitting to all who are over us, even those that we find ourselves uh, very much uh, contrary to. And Father, I pray that you would be all the more glorified, that as men see our good citizenship in this world, they see how we live a blameless life, that they would know, oh God, that there is something very different and very special, and it only comes from you. And Father, I pray that we would exalt Christ in all of these relationships. And Lord, help us to always be submissive to you, uh, to your word and to your will. Uh, Lord, it is, it is so easy for us to want our own way. Father, I, I do pray for the unsaved that are sitting here today or watching this online. Uh, Lord, I, I know not the heart, but you do. And Lord, you know if they will or will not submit to you. And I pray for those who have not submitted to you have not surrendered to you, have not come raising their white flag and asking for peace with you and repenting of their sins, that even today, Father, you would, you would turn them towards Christ and you would draw them to the Son in whom there is true and eternal freedom. And I pray that you would do it for your grace and your glory in your Son, Jesus' name, amen.